So good morning, everyone, and also perhaps good afternoon for our online audience in Asia. And now it's our great honor to have Professor Saloni's second talk in the Trinity Center of Asian Studies. The title is What One Needs to Know About Tangut Buddhism. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, for the introduction, now let's, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, begin now. Uh, what we need to know uh, about the uh, Buddhism among uh, Tanguts and basically what uh, there is to know. Uh, last time we have uh, some discussions about the Tangut uh, history in general uh, today, so we'll be a little bit more uh, specific. Uh, the situation in the uh, Tangut uh, realm was such that it existed only for a rather limited uh, time span, well, generally, probably even less than 200 years, uh, if we uh, follow the original Tangut chronology, that will be slightly over uh, 200 years. So, the, but that's not really that long. Uh, despite that, as we have mentioned before, uh, the uh, Tanguts were able to develop quite a unique culture with their own script. Uh, with their uh, own uh, specific or well, with their own indigenous literature and other things too which are which we have uh, briefly discussed uh, during our uh, last meeting uh, now today we talk a little bit about the uh, Tangut version of uh, Buddhism uh, if you look on the map we can see uh, quite easily yeah uh, that the uh, Tangut trial is just in between yeah uh, so to the south, uh, we have the uh, northern Sung. Uh, to the north is the Great Liao, the Kitan state. Uh, whereas to the south, we have the domains of Uyghurs, the Tibetans, and still uh, further on. Uh, so the uh, Tangut state or the Tangut realm is just in the middle uh, between uh, the northern Sung, the Kitans, and is adjacent to the Amdo and Kam areas, yeah, of what is now uh, Qinghai province. Uh, so, as we can uh, basic, as we can uh, infer from the uh, map directly, uh, there were two major uh, cultural impacts which have determined uh, the formation of the Tangut culture. So, one would be you know, from the central plains and to the west, uh, whereas uh, the one originating uh, from the Tibetan plateau was yeah, to the east. Yeah, so, and just these two uh, mainstreams, they generally collapsed with each other on the Tango territory, and that is how it uh, continues uh, uh, further. Uh, then uh, why would we need to study, yeah? A Tangut uh, a Buddhism in general or Tangut texts. Uh, that is basically because that kind of research, uh, despite being interesting by itself, uh, also opens up some new perspective. Yeah, because we can, uh, uh, since the uh, texts are quite numerous and the historical sources are also quite available, uh, we can actually uh, trace the uh, pattern of cultural interactions on a variety of level. Uh, that is to say uh, that we can have the great traditions, so to speak, uh, which somehow uh, interact on the uh, lower level. So we said that we have the combination of between the macro level exchanges and the micro level exchanges or something which we can determine as the great tradition and the local tradition. And the local traditions, of course, sorry, and the great traditions, yeah, for example, the tradition of Sinitic Buddhism, they in fact interact, yeah, on the local level, yeah. So in order to see greater things, uh, we need to pay attention to uh, smaller details. Uh, so then we can see in terms of uh, propagation of Buddhism, we see the Sinitic, uh, among the Tangut texts, we see the uh, uh, Sinitic trends, uh, Tibetan, and something which uh, <clears throat> we identify as the Sino-Tibetan. 
Now, and what is sine of Tibetan, then we would actually uh, see. Uh, now, if we uh, continue uh, even further, uh, we would actually be able, <clears throat> at least to some extent or to some degree, uh, reconstruct uh, not just the uh, well overall picture, but uh, might be able to address uh, some specific details. Uh, for example, uh, what were the specific places uh, where, let's say, the Sinitic Buddhism in the Tangut realm originated? Or what was that area of mm, in the Tibetan plateau uh, from which uh, Tibetan texts, which we find uh, among the Tangut, within the Tangut collections, have originated? Uh, we might have actually be able to trace uh, much more specific lines of exchanges, yeah? Uh, for example, we can see uh, exchange or rather, well, probably exchange, yeah, between, let's say, the Tanguts and the Kitan, the Leao, yeah? Exchanges between uh, Tanguts and Uyghurs and also between Tanguts, Uyghurs, and Mongols, yeah? All of that is, mm, can be reconstructed. We will, won't be able to cover all of those uh, during the uh, today's meeting, uh, but just to get some indications of how those things actually uh, develop. Uh, the sole basis uh, for all of that research uh, is, of course, uh, the texts. Uh, now, the problem is uh, that uh, the Tanguts themselves, unlike, for example, Tibetans, and, of course, are unlike the uh, Chinese Buddhists, uh, they never really composed a Buddhist history for themselves. Or uh, more correct would be to say that there was one of which only a title survives. Uh, therefore, if we are looking uh, onto uh, historical matters, uh, then we are challenged with the situation uh, where we need to reconstruct history from the texts which originally are not historical by nature and were not designed as uh, the mm, tools or sources to study history. Uh, this is something which uh, some scholars would identify as extracting or finding history uh, from the Buddhist texts. Uh, such an understanding uh, is, I think, quite uh, limited and probably even inaccurate uh, because in practice it uh, all uh, limits itself to the study of the Buddhist colophons, which are, of course, very important, but not the sole source for reconstructing the history. And uh, a better approach would be, of course, as everybody knows, and that's uh, quite a, a trivial observation, uh, but uh, to look at texts in general as the produce of history, yeah? So we should not probably detach ourselves uh, from the study of, let's say, uh, from the study of the uh, text in its entirety, with its contents, with its ideology, and then, of course, from the uh, philological or from linguistic perspective, too. Uh, now, from that perspective, we actually have those groups of texts which we more or less can, more or less safely can identify. So there would be the texts of Sinitic origin. And for those we currently, on the basis of, of our recent research, identify two sources for that. So uh, one would be uh, the texts which have originated from the Leao of the Kitan origin. Uh, another major group of texts uh, originates from uh, Hanzhou area, I mean, historically. And we have uh, a group of texts which originally we said unclear provenance, uh, but this unclear provenance generally uh, indicates uh, that, generally indicates towards the Yunnan. To, towards the Dali area, uh, because this is that place where we can actually see 
uh, uh, some uh, Buddhist compositions, uh, which are more or less resembling what we have, for example, in the Tangut sources. Uh, when we look in the Tibetan texts, then we would actually see that uh, there are basically uh, two groups of texts. One would be the translations of Indic compositions, and those include a variety of texts, yeah? And the translations of original Tibetan works. Those are not that numerous as one would expect, by the way. And finally, we have something which we call local compositions, uh, representing the so-called Sino-Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, this particular category is not uh, very well identified or determined uh, because uh, it's just the texts for which we have not yet been able to identify either Chinese or uh, Tibetan source. They might have been, uh, of course, of local origin, uh, but not necessarily. So uh, the research here basically continues. Uh, for the uh, Tanguts themselves, uh, Buddhism uh, was a matter of uh, big importance. Uh, a while ago, we uh, had uh, an opportunity, not here in this audience, but another place, uh, to discuss the relationship between the uh, state and Buddhism uh, in Shisha and the so-called state protection. Uh, but even without a specific discussion, it is uh, quite obvious uh, that for the uh, Tanguts, it was an extremely important thing yeah, to have Buddhism. Uh, <clears throat> there is one Yuan period composition, which uh, basically which records a communication uh, between the, uh, the prince uh, Kodan and uh, one of the uh, former Tangut officials, Gao Ziya. And this Tangut official specifically told the Mongol prince uh, that if one would like to uh, rule just a state, a country, then the Confucianism or Confu the art of Confucius would be uh, sufficient. Whereas if one is intending to rule the whole world, then she, uh, then the one would follow or needs to follow the Buddha Dharma. So that's. Uh, then, if we look into the uh, uh, monuments of the Tangut uh, legislation, we actually see uh, uh, these texts here. Uh, those are categories of Buddhist learning, uh, which uh, monks uh, who intended for promotion. Uh, within the uh, clerical system that they were supposed to master. Uh, these are the categories here, which are listed. So one would be uh, Prajna Paramita, then uh, Jung Dao, yeah, which is uh, the translation of Madhyamika, which is Uma in Tibet. Uh, then the Avatamsaka or Huayan Buddhism, uh, the so-called Hundred Dharmas, and uh, Vaisu, Vijnanavada. Uh, this uh, list is followed by the uh, is concluded by something which we uh, which is translated as awakening of faith, and uh, this particular one is uh, specifically controversial because uh, it can both represent the famous treatise of Chinese Buddhism, the awakening of faith in Mahayana, or might be a general rubric uh, for the. Um, Buddhist rituals, specifically for the awakening of the bodhicitta. Uh, if that's correct, I mean, that needs to be determined, uh, so we will leave it here. Uh, so uh, these are the categories uh, which are the groups of, uh, or rather dimensions of Buddhist doctrine or teaching, uh, which a Tangut monk was supposed to know, at least one of them. Uh, on the basis of our work, now we can identify or add to that a variety of other texts. And I think the most clearly identifiable uh, textual group is the Ushang Yudya, 
Anuttara Yoga. Uh, something for which we, of course, establish the Tibet knowledge. Now, from the uh, point of view of the actual contents of those categories, uh, we can observe, yeah, that they are, some of those are composed specifically of the text, text translated from Tibet. For example, the Vaisu. Uh, whereas the category of the hundred dharmas, which is basically Mahayana Abhidharma, is based on the Sinitic texts, which we currently trace either to the Sidan Liao, to the Liao areas, or, well, basically to the uh, modern Beijing and Hebei, uh, those areas. Uh, of course, Avatamsaka lineage is specifically uh, Sinitic. Uh, and being one of the major so-called schools of the Chinese Buddhism, but it was quite a special thing uh, also among the Tanguts. The Zhongdao, the Madhyamika, uh, was specifically Tibetan, uh, whereas the uh, Prajna Paramita was Sino-Tibetan and included compositions or, let's say, things derived or based on Kumarajiva, Jumolosu, yeah, who is, of course, a very famous uh, uh, Chinese translator, and also included uh, uh, compositions by some, such people as Kamala Shila and others. So that's more or less how that is. Uh, another uh, thing which uh, we should probably mention here in this respect uh, would be that the variety that uh, the although those categories they are mentioned in the uh, local yeah and were determined as the subject of subjects of study. Uh, for the but by the state, yeah, uh, the actual excavated materials uh, they generally correspond with the with those rubrics, uh, with one specific exception, which basically uh, means that uh, the majority of the texts of the Tibetan origin, specifically uh, the texts which we identify as esoteric, yeah, the texts of the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, so to speak. Uh, those are not discovered uh, in, are not mentioned in the Tangut law. Uh, why is that? That's probably because uh, the law tends to uh, determine or proceeds from the previous situation, yeah, and it's not uh, like modern and up-to-date, yeah, but that's uh, another option. So what can we say about the uh, Tangut uh, history? As we can emerge it, uh, as we can uh, 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 excerpt it from the Buddhist texts. Uh, first of all, we can clearly see, yeah, uh, that uh, there was uh, a certain um, evolution of the acceptance of the Tangut Buddhist texts. If we look into the history in general, into the Chinese sources, then we will see that, uh, as Shi Zimbo has once calculated, we have altogether six instances or uh, when the uh, Tangut government imported Buddhist sutras uh, from the Song dynasty, from the Northern Song. Altogether, uh, six instances. Uh, so uh, the first stage of the Buddhist translations in Shisha was, of course, based on the Chinese materials, based on the Chinese materials. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometime in the uh, 30s and in the 40s of the 12th century, uh, something important uh, happened uh, in the Tango Trial. Uh, there were uh, some important uh, developments in both uh, political and uh, cultural sphere. And one of those would be, of course, the increasing contact with the Western regions of the Tango Trial. Uh, that is when uh, majority or a lot of uh, Tibetan masters, or just maybe Tibetans, yeah, uh, started to travel into the Tangut land. 
Uh, these developments are documented, for example, in the later Tangut locals, yeah, which sometimes speak about the Tibetan masters or, or like rather Tibetan monks uh, coming to the Western border. And the law says that some of them uh, are coming to propagate the teaching, the uh, Buddha Dharma, and we welcome these people. Uh, whereas some are engaged in the horse trade or doing all the all sorts of uh, commercial activities. And the, with these people, we are not particularly happy. Yeah, so uh, that's how that was. Uh, the uh, increasing uh, familiarity with the uh, Tibetan texts uh, initiated somehow uh, a process of uh, addition, so to speak, or correction of earlier translations. Uh, just as we observe it for some episodes in the, let's say, history of the Buddhist translations, for example, in the uh, earlier period of the Buddhist propagation in China too, the difference between the old translations and the late translations are generally not very big. And specifically uh, cover, let's say, the uh, transcriptions of Sanskrit. Now here I have uh, this uh, for the Tango texts. This was originally discovered by uh, Nishida Tatsu and then uh, uh, Kepin too, and then, but it's generally now a common place. I have just this uh, very uh, uh, little example here uh, of the Tango translations, old and new. That's for just this one word, Adharma, yeah, which is Fa in Chinese. Uh, if we look here, the word Tchamo, yeah, uh, this is the one uh, originating uh, from uh, the uh, Chinese transcription of the word. Yeah, that's basically Damo, yeah. Uh, that is how it was translated by Kumarajiva and even before Kumarajiva and after Kumarajiva as well, yeah? Now, as we can see, this Tamo is not the translation of the Sanskrit word, the Harma, yeah? Uh, but this is a Tangut transcription of the Chinese transcription of Tangut, yeah? So it's quite complicated. Uh, now, the one below here is Dharmo, yeah? Uh, this is the new translation. And as we can see, it quite uh, carefully accounts uh, for the uh, sound of Sanskrit, yeah, because, and it has this archa, yeah, this small character attached to the first syllable, so it probably reads like drama, yeah. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's generally a uh, much more correct uh, representation of the Sanskrit original. And uh, these, such examples are actually quite numerous. Uh, Nishida Tatsu managed to identify that on the basis of the tank of the two translations of the platform uh, of the what it is of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, but more or less similar situation emerges when we count other examples as well. Uh, now we have reasons to believe uh, that the translations from Tibetan in the Tango realm, uh, they probably started earlier when we originally thought. And uh, probably we can date the earliest time, the earliest uh, translations from Tibetan probably by 1142 or some such. Uh, but we have a more or less well-established date, 1153, uh, which is basically the time for which we are sure that the Tibetan texts, and quite a lot of them, were already circulating in their Tangut versions. Again, uh, such a revision of the Buddhist translations uh, was not just uh, limited uh, to the uh, Buddhist texts. Uh, here we are dealing with a 
quite a major project, uh, which generally was aimed not just at editing the Buddhist texts themselves, uh, but on editing or correcting or whatever of the Tangut literary heritage in general. Uh, originally, the scholarship would observe that most of the texts which we have at our disposal, they probably date for the period after 1150. Now, this is a correct observation. Uh, but it generally says that it's not only that the Buddhist texts date to that period, but the majority of other texts too belong to the same time. So it's not that Buddhist texts only had been revised, but the Tangut heritage in general. Uh, why would that be? And what were the reasons for that? Yeah, uh, that at the moment we are not sure, but uh, we must be thinking in that direction so far. Uh, so uh, these are more or less preliminary observations. Now we would probably need to talk more about some specific things. And we will start from the uh, Sinitic sources. Uh, as uh, previous scholarship, including not only myself, but also uh, other colleagues, uh, have more or less uh, agree. There is a consensus uh, saying that uh, probably uh, the most well represented uh, tradition of Sinitic Buddhism among the Tanguts was the so called Huaya. As you all know, this is the school of Sinitic Buddhism which emerged in the uh, Sui dynasty and then continued during the Tang dynasty. Uh, and its main source, its main source of authority was the so-called Huayan Jing or Avatamsaka Sutra, which exists in three Chinese translations. Translation in 80 chapters, translation in, uh, uh, sorry, translation in 60 chapters, a translation in 90 chapters and translation in 40 chapters. Uh, the main leaders of that school, as represented uh, uh, by the, as represented, well, were uh, several people. Uh, among the leaders of the Chinese uh, leaders of the Avatamsaka school, there are two people who are crucial for our discussion. One would be uh, Changguan or Qinlan Changguan. Uh, the monk who lived for a hundred years, uh, he was born, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 738 and died in 848, so 101, uh, who was followed by his student Zongmi, or Guifan Zongmi, uh, who lived much uh, a shorter life uh, from uh, 760 to 842. Uh, these two masters, or these two scholars, uh, they were generally responsible for the Hawaiian school as it more or less survives. Uh, there were, of course, other masters, and of course, the most famous uh, master, Xian Shou Fazang, yeah? But for the uh, Tangut version of the Hawaiian teaching, this was not exactly important. Now, what has happened is that in the final years of the Tang dynasty, well, not final years. Uh, there was the so-called uh, Buddhist persecution by the Emperor Uzong. It was a Huichamiev, yeah, that Huichamiev war. Well, it's quite a well-known event. Now, this persecution generally undermined uh, all those, uh, the development of the, those major schools of Chinese Buddhism, including Huayan. Uh, and the second birth, the resurrection of those Buddhist traditions and of Huayan too happened during the Northern Sung Dynasty uh, in the south, in the area of uh, modern Hanzhou, in and around this place. And the resurrection of those traditions was generally assisted 
uh, by the texts uh, re-imported from Korea and from Japan. So this is the outline of the history. Uh, so uh, if we look uh, into the uh, Tangu texts here, uh, we can actually see yeah, uh, that uh, the Huayan lineage is represented by the works of Zongmi here and of his master Changwai. Another uh, uh, thing which is also quite important for our discussion would be this person called Guanzi Bansung. Now, what about him? Uh, this Guanzi Bansung is not a very famous master because Changguan and Zongmi, yeah, those are very, very, very important Buddhist scholars in China. And they were important not only for uh, Buddhism in China in general, but also for Korea, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and other areas as well. Now, this Guanzi Bansu was a much less known person. Uh, his area was uh, more or less the area of uh, modern Kaifeng, of the of Kaifeng. He was from Yishan in the uh, Kaifeng area. Uh, active sometime during the 11th century. Some of his works survive uh, uh, in Chinese and some also in Tangut. Yeah, but we will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, the second well-represented category of texts in Sinaitic Buddhism will be just as we see here, will be the Baifa, the Hundred Dharmas, uh, just as we said. Uh, the lineage of the hundred dharmas is pretty obvious because this hundred dharmas or Mahayana Abhidharma uh, that uh, uh, is generally based on the Tanku translations of Xuanzang's work. Of Xuanzang's work. And the final category of the text which we probably need to pay attention would be the uh, Chan Buddhist compositions. Uh, those are also quite uh, numerous and also worthy of our attention. We'll talk about those. Uh, well, uh, uh, Huayan Buddhism, again, is uh, probably the best documented tradition uh, in uh, Tangut Buddhism. Uh, why is it so? Uh, we have this particular person here whose name is Yixin Huizhue. So it's not just my WeChat, but it's also a person uh, from the Yuan Dynasty. He's a very well-known master, uh, generally active uh, during the early Yuan or the middle Yuan, Yuan Mongol period, uh, in the areas of uh, Luoyang and also in Shan. And he was responsible for the restoration and repairs in many important Buddhist temples, including, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong on this one, but maybe maybe I'm right, I think I'm right, I'm correct, including the White Horse Temple, the Bai Masi at Loya. Yeah? Uh, he has a repentance ritual, a composition here, where he lists, it's not probably by him, by later, yeah? The transmission of the Huayan lineage, of the teaching of Huayan Sutra, uh, among the Tanguts. Uh, so uh, on the basis of this, I'm not going to dwell uh, too much into uh, that thing, but if we look at those highlighted in red, in, in yellow, sorry, Da Shu Chao and Da Su and other things, uh, these texts are the commentaries to the Avatamsaka Sutra composed by Chongwai. So this is basically uh, what the Tanguts were doing. So for them, the main source of the Huayan scholarship was the Tang period, uh, the compositions by uh, Changwai. Uh, and finally, but this, uh, yeah. So uh, this is more or less uh, uh, how that worked. 
such an attention to the teachings of uh, Chen Guan uh, is also uh, quite understandable uh, because his activities, uh, well, partially because he lived so long, uh, were somehow concentrated in the area of Wutaishan, in the area of Wutaishan, uh, where his most of his compositions were uh, recorded. Now, being at Wutai Shan, yeah, he put down together his uh, Yan Yi Chao, that would be his uh, oral explanations uh, to the text, and those had been uh, written down. Uh, but the problem is uh, that uh, Wutai Shan, yeah, and this whole area of Hebei province, and still further north, uh, generally uh, was not impacted uh, by the Buddhist persecutions of the late Tang period. So uh, the Buddhist scholarship in the north, including the Utaishan area, but also uh, the areas of modern Beijing and, may, and parts of Hebei province in general, uh, the Tang heritage or the Tang Buddhist heritage basically continued. And this is something which determined, yeah, the continuity of the Tang Dynasty Buddhism, first in the Liao among the Kitan, and then also among the Tangus. So uh, this situation with the Dashu Chao is generally reflexive, yeah, of the uh, Tang period succession or continuity, uh, found not only in the Tangut Buddhism but also in the Buddhism of the Kitan Dynasty. Uh, so for this, yeah, we can generally see, yeah, that uh, there are texts in the Tangut collections which directly indicate uh, the relationship between the Kitan Buddhists or the Liao and Xixia. And these things are connected with specifically this lineage, uh, Shi Mo He Yan Lun, yeah? And that is another composition uh, which is probably a spurious uh, text and not the text originally uh, composed in India, uh, but we have historical indications uh, that this text was specifically popular among the Kitani, among the Liao people. And we see quite a big tradition of the study of this Shi Mohayanlu among the Tangles, both in Chinese and in Tangle translations. So here we can actually observe, yeah, uh, that there was a connection between the uh, Kitan Buddhists and the Tangut Buddhists. Uh, even if we uh, exceed a little bit uh, the limits of this discussion, we can basically say uh, that uh, the so-called Semitic Buddhism among the Tanguts was in fact uh, the Buddhism of the Liao, yeah? But this, of course, doesn't mean yeah, that the Kitan people themselves were responsible. Of course, that's all in Chinese, yeah, that's Sinitic Buddhism. And a variety of texts of such uh, of this subject matter, they also arrive in Tangut translations. So what I'm trying to say is that in the northern China, in the uh, northern areas, including modern uh, Hebei, including the parts of what is now Inner Mongolia, and then further to the west, including the Tangut state, and even still further to the west and to the south, up to the modern Dali area. It's in Yunnan province. Because the texts of similar subject matter, they also emerge there. We can see that uh, this, despite the uh, linguistic variety, uh, besides being written in different languages, those texts, they basically speak about the same thing about this Huayan Buddhism. So from a general perspective, we can see, yeah, uh, that there was some kind of a, a cultural or religious cultural unity, so to speak, or even or uniformity in the area stretching, well, if I'm allowed to exaggerate maybe a little bit, uh, basically from Korea to Yunnan province. Uh, the thing is that, and those were all gravitating around that Huayan Buddhism. 
in that lay tongue version. What I'm trying to say here is that we should not really be exaggerating the importance of linguistic diversity. Okay, there would be texts written in uh, Chinese, there would be texts uh, written in Tangut, and there would be texts written in Uyghur. But the problem is that they all belong to the same tradition. They are interconnected despite being composed in uh, varying languages. I guess this is something which we should really be uh, paying attention to. Uh, there are even closer uh, indications. Uh, for example, uh, if we can see this in uh, that brown book, uh, which I have written, yeah, uh, there is this uh, that's the composition by a Buddhist master whose name is Tuni Hansa. Uh, Tuni Hansa is a very important monk uh, from the late period of the Qidan, of the Qidan Liao. He is, if you are familiar with the uh, stone sutras, with the Shi Jing Ya uh, around Beijing, he is the one who is responsible for the completion of the Fangshan uh, Buddhist texts for the carving. Uh, but his works, and he is a specific person from the Liao. Yeah? Now, if we look into Chinese sources, almost none of his compositions survive in Chinese. Whereas in Tangut, and among the Harahoto findings, we find plenty. So that generally is indicative, yeah, uh, that these two areas, at least, yeah, the Liao and Xixia and the Tangus, they really belonged to more or less similar circle, yeah, of Buddhist doctrines circulating therein. Uh, in order not to be, uh, in order to be more specific, yeah, uh, oh, I actually, uh, we can see a, a couple of uh, quotations uh, from the, uh, let's say, uh, travelogues of the Japanese monks uh, who came to China, to the Song Dynasty, and uh, uh, before that to the Tan Dynasty, uh, to study Buddhism to study Buddhism. And now we can actually see, for example, in the works of uh, Enin, Enchin, yeah, uh, the situation uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, Buddhism in the North uh, really continued as it was uh, during the during the Tan Dynasty. Uh, now, for the uh, hundred dharmas texts, for the hundred dharmas, uh, we should address to this person, to this person, whose name is Chuan Xiao, right here. Chuan Xiao or Chuan Min. Also a famous Buddhist, a famous scholar uh, uh, from the Beijing area, basically. Yeah. Uh, his things, and uh, he was a student of, well, Yogacara Buddhism. Uh, but also responsible uh, for the publication, uh, he was one of the editors of the Qidan of the Liao Buddhist canon. So, a very important person. And uh, now we have uh, indications, uh, let's say from uh, from Georgian, from San, San Tendai uh, Godai Sangi, yeah? who specifically mentioned that uh, Qian Xiao's work was very popular among the among the, the monks there at the Wutai Shan, at the Wutai Mount. Uh, this is the list of his compositions here. Uh, not that any of that really emerges uh, in the Tangut collections, uh, but the general overtone, so to speak, the general balance of what we have in uh, Tangut texts for the uh, Hundred Dharmas for the uh, Yogacara is actually more or less uh, similar to that, is more or less similar to that. Uh, so, yeah, these are the similar tendency from the point of view of the subject matter. Uh, we still observe roughly more or less in the same period uh, for other parts of Hebei province. Yeah, for example, in Jandin, yeah, which is Jandin now, yeah, 
uh, there is the uh, Lu Xianzi, for example, uh, with the monk Shou Tian, who was also responsible for the uh, resurrection of uh, Chinese Yogacara, also during the uh, also during the Sun Dynasty. Those are all uh, very important events and uh, worth examining uh, further. But we will uh, refrain from doing that here. Uh, so generally, uh, if we uh, address from uh, the, that situation, yeah, uh, should not be a very, I would say, surprising, yeah, uh, because if we actually look into the uh, Buddhist neighborhood, so to speak, yeah, of the Tangut Buddhism, we can actually see quite easily, yeah, that basically the Leo Buddhism, I mean, the Buddhist texts, I mean, then the Buddhist uh, uh, structures were all over, yeah. Qinzhou Baitha and the Yingxian Mutha, those are just to name a few. And those provide, especially the Mutha, uh, provide the textual materials for our uh, study, not only of Kitan Buddhism, but also of the uh, uh, Tangut Buddhism too. Then again, such famous places as Yinshan Tali near Beijing. And of course, Yunjiu Si in Fangshan, yeah. Uh, those are also the areas which can be directly or indirectly uh, connected with the development of the uh, Tangut Buddhism, yeah, with the specific versions of uh, Xixia. Uh, okay, so uh, what uh, uh, we would like to uh, follow, yeah, uh, if we, uh, because uh, we probably should try to spend some time on uh, the evolution of the uh, Sinitic Buddhism among the Tangus. Uh, we have this uh, quite, I would say, popular, mm, well, I wouldn't call it a slogan, but uh, rather an uh, abbreviation. Uh, these four characters, Han Zhang Yuan Rong. So this is the conflation or merge between the Sinitic and Tibetan. Uh, sometimes uh, other colleagues, uh, for example, uh, yeah, they would also add xian mi, yeah, so exoteric and esoteric. So han zang xian mi yuan rong. Well, we can probably proceed from that, but uh, I think what is really important, yeah, is that we should really understand what we mean when we talk about Sino Tibet. I mean, in terms of Buddhism. Uh, this is not just because uh, there are two ways of looking into it. Uh, one would be that we can see that during the Tangut, the Shisha period, and then further into the Yuan period, uh, quite uh, a number of the Tangut composition, or sorry, of Tibetan texts had been translated into Chinese. <laughs> These translations, they existed in the Yuan period. Some translations were done during the Ming and, of course, during the Qin dynasty as well. So then we would probably say that those are certain lineages of Tibetan Buddhism, which were transmitted also in Chinese language. But just like I said, I mean, we probably should not be uh, exaggerating the uh, linguistic the, uh, affiliation. And then there is a more narrow thing. And this narrow thing generally means, yeah, that in the close examinations of texts, we can actually determine or identify uh, several levels of interaction between Sinitic and Tibet. Here, I would only limit myself to a very few things and specifically talking about uh, one particular text. We just mentioned it a little bit. It's called Sindhi Fama. That's the title of the text. Sindhi Fama, which basically means, yeah, the Dharma gate, Dharma Paraya of the mind ground. Uh, in, from the perspective of its subject matter, uh, this text is talking about, as, you, as we can see, it's about uh, Dun Wu and Dun Xiu about the sudden enlightenment and sudden or gradual 
cultivation. Uh, this sounds quite enigmatic, I would say, but uh, generally uh, the relationship uh, between enlightenment and, or I would say awakening and contemplation, uh, uh, sorry, and cultivation, xiuxian, yeah? Uh, this was a major topic for discussion in the uh, during the Tang Dynasty, and the monks were very much uh, interested uh, how these two things combine together. Uh, we are not uh, talking about uh, this those Buddhist ideas here, but what I would like to draw your uh, attention to uh, would be here. This is a discussion, as we can see here. It's Chan Yuan Xu. Uh, this is an abridged title of the composition by this particular person. Zhongmi. This is a very famous uh, uh, Sinitic text, uh, very, very important for the monastic education. And this is also uh, devoted yeah, uh, to uh, this study. So there is a, an argument here on top. We should not concern ourselves with the, its essence right now. And further on, the uh, author uh, leads, uh, sorry, uh, introduces the supporting quotations. And so here we can see Bao Zijin, which is Maharatna Kuta, that's a Chinese, Sinitic. Uh, formal social of Ajin, yeah, that's the Ashta Sahasrik, I think. But then please look further. Uh, there is this text here. Pu Zhao Wang Jing. Now, what is this Pu Zhao Wang Jing? Yeah. Uh, this is actually a Chinese or rather Tangu translation of a very important Ningma or the old school, Kunjet Gyutpa, of the Ningma school of Tibetan Buddhism, one of their texts. So we can see, and this text was not uh, known at all in Sinaitic Buddhism, and well, basically still isn't. Uh, so as we can see here, discussing subject matter pertaining specifically uh, to the Sinaitic Buddhism, uh, the author of this Dharma Gate of the Mind Ground, he is referring to a Tibetan Nyingma text if we look still further down below, it's fine, something, the character is missing because the text is, and then it's Ben Shui. Now, what is Ben Shui? Uh, a Ben Shui is, in fact, uh, my understanding of this word. It's not a Chinese word, original. Uh, but this is a word, uh, because there is such a Chinese word. Yeah, If we look, uh, for example, into the uh, Buddhist uh, Tripitaka and search, that would emerge quite often, Ban Shui. Uh, Ban Shui is the uh, Chinese word based originally on a Tangut word. And this Tangut word uh, meant Tantra. So, Tantra. Yeah? Now, this fun is Brahma, so it's Brahma something Tantra. And it says so. So again, this is a Tibetan text. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this is the, a very characteristic example of what actual Sino-Tibetan, in fact, looks like. Uh, it's not just a, let's say, translation of a Tibetan text into Chinese, uh, but rather introduction of the Tibetan materials, for example, into the fabric of the discussion of, let's say, Sinitic uh, matters. If we go still further uh, in that second, which is actually the third now, extract, we can again see that's a Jian Xu Jian Wu. This is again the uh, from Chinese. Uh, again, we see the quotations from the Chan Yuan Xu, yeah, which is the composition of Bai Zumi again. But look further, here we see the Zhen Shu Ming Jing. Uh, Zheng Shi Minjing is, again, a very important Indic and Tibetan text. Yeah, Manju Shri Namasamgiti. Now, this text was first translated into Chinese, yeah, also by the Tangus. 
and it circulated in Sisha in like two versions because the uh, and this quotation here, which is even more important, is quite uh, directly uh, identified uh, in the Tangut version, one of the Tangut versions of the Manju Shirinama Samgiti Jenshi Minjin, but also in the Chinese translation by Shiju. Uh, Shiju was also a uh, Yuan dynasty monk of uh, Tangut origin, in all probability. That's more or less how we see. So this is the interaction between Sinitic and Tibetan, one of the examples. Uh, if we go just a little bit further, then there would be another text which I would like to uh, draw your attention to, and that's something, I mean, we've been discussing it for quite some time. It's a famous composition which uh, for which I translate uh, Chinese something like, we should give them a brief note to the essential meaning of the schematic commentary to Diamond Sutta with Gatas. Yeah, it's a very long title. Yeah, but uh, so it's Jin Gan Jin Kepan, something like that would be in Chinese, but that's a Tangu text. Now, this Tangu text is famous for what? It is famous, as we all know, the Vajra uh, Chedik or Jin Gan Jin was translated into Chinese by uh, Kumarajiva. Kumarajiva. Uh, by Jim Lawson. And here is my translation from Tangut, yeah, of this text here. Uh, we would probably uh, go a little bit uh, uh, here. When everyone says, when he was promoting the teaching of valid cognition, that's uh, logic, yeah, Buddhist logic, his name was Direction Elephant. Now, this Direction Elephant, if uh, and allow this, uh, we read it like, well, the uh, Chinese for direction element would be something like Fang Xiang, yeah? Uh, the Xuanzang's uh, version translation of the text would be you, would be like this. Uh, this person is a better known in the, the Chinese Buddhism by this name, Chenna. So, Dinara. Dinara. Uh, then we go just a little bit further and we see later when he was spreading the teaching of the Middle Way, Madhyamika, Jundal, he was known as Kamala Shiva. Still later, when he was propagating the teaching of secret mantras in the Bodriel, in the Bodriel, yeah? Uh, he was known as Krishna Pada Jr. The Bodh realm here means, of course, Tibet. And then when he finally uh, came to the land of the great China, uh, he started to uh, transmit Buddhist scriptures and became known as Rajiva. And then, okay, that is, although he stayed in the world for 517 years, his appearance remained uh, that of a youth. Uh, that he was called an adolescent. Uh, I will not see because the actual, the, the Sandhya design uh, uh, for this Kumarajiva is very wrong. Yeah, it's actually mistaken, but that doesn't matter. So what we can actually see here, Kumarajiva, who of course is a very known, Jumulos is a very known Buddhist translator. Yeah. Uh, in the Tangut understanding, uh, the three people, Dinaga, that direction elephant, Chana. Uh, then Kamala Shila, Lian Hua Jia, and Krishna Pada, Hei Xiao Zhu, Krishna Pada, I just said, uh, Hei Zhu, yeah, are the same person. And also the translator Kumarajiva, they are the same person. Uh, what do we make out of that? If we look into the Tangut Buddhist collection, collections of texts, uh, then we could actually see, yeah, uh, that there is a variety of texts on valid cognition, on Buddhist logic, written by this direction elephant. Uh, quite a lot of uh, texts on the Madhyamika, on the middle way. Uh, and then a lot of esoteric or tantric texts uh, by or associated way with this Krishna Pada, because 
those are also important Buddhist masters in India and Tibet. So basically, as we can see, and the majority of the Buddhist sutras which circulated in the Tango Trial, uh, they were based on Kumarajiva's translations. So here we can see that Kumarajiva basically represents uh, the whole yeah, of Tango Buddhism, of both its Sinitic and Tibetan elements. They somehow conflate together in this Kumarajiva's figure. Uh, that is more or less how we interpret the meaning of the text. Now, the problem, of course, is that we don't know if uh, this uh, if this understanding uh, was like a commonplace, was generally accepted uh, by the Tangut clergy in general, because that's obviously wrong from the historical perspective. Yeah. All these people with whom Kumarajiva is identified, they are, of course, they are not contemporaries at all, of course, I would say, yeah? And, Kumara, and Kumarajiva's translating the Buddhist sutras uh, happened, let's say, before Kamalashila or Krishnapad, yeah? But nonetheless, yeah? So the chronology is also wrong. The chronology is also wrong. Uh, but this is not the matter of factual accuracy, yeah? Uh, that's more like a, a matter of uh, constructing or construing, like, a historical reality. All right. Uh, so if we just conclude a little bit, uh, then we would say that uh, we have Tung Li Han and Yuan Tung Dao Yeah, these are the two Lao Buddhist masters uh, here, I didn't really, because this point four, yeah, I have, uh, I should delete that because this is wrong, yeah, and now we have a much more uh, advanced understanding of the Luzu Huinan, of the sixth patriarch and his uh, uh, heritage in the, uh, uh, in the Tangut state, yeah, and the tradition of the Simoha Yanlun, for example, yeah, uh, that is generally uh, how we observe now the uh, origins of the uh, Sinitic Buddhism in China. Uh, what I'm trying to say here, I have this small conclusion, Sinitic Buddhism in Sisya was similar to the Lao, but incorporated more elements, probably of the Northern Song origin, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I guess that should be probably also reconsidered, uh, meaning that uh, Tangut Buddhism or Sinitic Buddhism in Sisya is in fact representative of a much larger tradition which geographically spread from Korea to basically Yunnan province, as we know. It. This uh, and this uh, uh, religious tradition or textual tradition included texts, of course, and the source materials were in the Ch in Chinese, but also the texts in uh, Tangut and in Uyghur. Now the problem is that we know about this lineage of this huge tradition basically through the Tanku texts, uh, because uh, not much of specific compositions uh, in Chinese, for example, have survived. So that is one of the important reasons. Now let's say, uh, talk a little bit uh, about the Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, when we talk about uh, Tibetan Buddhism, yeah, uh, we generally, but uh, this was originally designed for the study of Tibetan, but it also qualifies for the Chinese too. We talk about the so-called textual clusters. Uh, what the, what's that supposed to mean? Uh, the textual clusters basically, yeah, uh, it, that is a collection of texts. One core composition, one basic composition, and a group of texts which are gravitating around. Like, for example, we have one main text and commentaries and like whatever. Uh, uh, that is a mechanical device uh, basically used to arrange the textual variety in a more or less uh, coherent way. Now we have, for example, for Jundao, we basically have the Satyadvaya Vatara, for Tarka, uh, we have Nyayambindu, uh, all these compositions, but let me just say,
so uh, when do we talk about the propagation or distribution of uh, Tibetan Buddhism under Tanguts, yeah? Uh, that we basically observe uh, what we generally proceed from esoteric Buddhism or from tantric Buddhism. Uh, this is not a necessarily correct observation, but the texts are really numerous. Uh, from what we know now, uh, is that we can observe uh, generally uh, that uh, the available texts from Harahoto and also from other, uh, other locations are not fully or completely representative of the actual situation on the ground. Because the texts whose titles emerge, for example, Mahaguhya Yoga, Vajra Shekara Tantra, Yamanta Katantra, Chakra Samvara Tantra, and others, they are not found in the Tango translations, but they were again mentioned by Ishin Huijue uh, in his Hawaiian Repentance Ritual, that at least there was some familiarity with those texts. Uh, we have the Samputa Tantra, we have a Vajra Panjara Tantra, those are very important compositions of uh, Hivajra and Chakra Samvara lineages. We just uh, know about that. Uh, okay. So, uh, when we uh, talk a little bit, yeah, then we would probably um, address to some matters which are kind of not that very obvious, yeah, and would require some explanation, so to speak. Uh, as we know, there is one of those major traditions of esoteric Buddhism, of Tantric Buddhism, was the so-called Shijingang or Hivajra Tantra. Hivajra Tantra. Uh, well, and there were several lineages of the transmission of this Hivajra Tantra, and but mostly, well, connected with uh, the very famous Tibetan translator Marpa. Marpa, that I think who is quite well known. Uh, what we have in the uh, Tangut uh, situation is that this Hivajra Tantra as a root text, text itself, is probably, is unavailable. We don't know if the actual root text of the Tantra was ever translated. Uh, the way Tanguts translated uh, Tibetan esoteric text, texts uh, was that they translated it with the commentary because they were studying. So they would not, would not just uh, rewrite something in Tangut from Tibetan, as the Tibetans did most of the time, but they would rather do it through a commentary so that they actually understand what they're doing. So in our collection, we have this text, which is like notes to the Hivajra uh, Tantra. Now, in these notes to the Hivajra Tantra, we have a colophon, which we translate in Chinese as Sifan Zhong Wo San Zan Ban Jida, Ram Lu Gong Wa. Uh, Sifan Zhong Wo, yeah, that's a very well-known Tangut saying. Sifan Zhong Wo basically means Tibet. Basically means Tibet. Uh, Ban Jida is okay. And the name him, Ram Lu Gong Wa. That Ram Lugonwa was all was for a quite some time and rather enigmatic figure. However, due to the work of uh, younger colleagues, for example, uh, Cecile Duchet from France, but also other as uh, as well, now we know that this name represents Ram Lugonwa. Again, it's not necessary to uh, know who he was. He was one of those uh, Hivajra masters. The actual thing is that he was popular and well-respected in the realm of those Hivajra studies, let's say during the 12th century. But later, he was, his tradition generally disappeared. Uh, there was a lot of reasons to, there were a lot of reasons to that. But the problem is that so far, we don't really know, we don't really have available texts in Tibetan. From Ramla Gompa, but we have a Tangut one. The same is true as for that text, Yi Yu Xi Jingang, 
that's the mandala of the nine deities and of Hivajra Tantra, uh, uh, also composed by Ram Lugova. So these are the two texts which are unavailable, at least for the moment, in Tibetan. So what we can say here is at least the lineage of Hivajra represents the actual situation in Tibetan Buddhism in, let's say, 12th century. Thereafter, afterwards, probably uh, because this Ram Lugumpa tradition disappeared. But when the Tanguts were studying Tibetan Buddhism, it was actually very active and very like peculiar. So that's why they turned. It represented the modern situation. Yeah. Uh, the same is true. Yeah. For example, uh, but uh, for uh, for example, for uh, other texts as well, for uh, uh, Amlita Prabha and also uh, the Sri Hivajan Namasada. Yeah. Those are all compositions by Don't Be Heruka and Saraduha. Now, again, uh, for the from the Sino Tibetan perspective, we should probably address to this text in Chinese called Datsan Yadao Midi. Datsan Yadao Midi, if we can say that like collections on the essential path of Mahayana, something like that. Uh, my colleague, Shinverong, is a great expert on this text. And he authored a lot of papers and book chapters about it. It's a very, very important composition. It's in Chinese, uh, but, uh, but its subject matter is a collection of uh, many, many texts uh, from the Yuan and Ming periods on Tibetan Buddhism. Some of those are from Pagba Lama, Sakya Pandita, and others. What is important here is this Dutch and Yadao Midi, uh, closer to the end, uh, contains uh, a selection of texts identified with the tradition of Mahamudra Tafu, or Shoji, whatever. Yeah? Jagajapo, in Tibetan, that would be. And these texts, for quite a while, uh, remained, as we say, uh, enigmatic. We didn't really know uh, what to say about those. Uh, but shortly, well, not so long ago, we have actually identified that the texts collected in the Chinese, Dutch and Yadao Midi, in the section on Shouyin, on Mahamudra, are in fact uh, the texts of, they uh, are all found in the Harakota collection. They all exist in Tangut. Moreover, although this is a, I would say, a debatable conclusion, but yet we suppose, and we have certain proof to that, uh, that actually the Chinese texts were translated from Tangut and by the Tangut too. Uh, so one would expect it quite to be a vice versa, but in this particular situation, we somewhat clearly observe uh, that these texts are also of, uh, that the Chinese texts, they actually emerged from, from the Tangut. What is the provenance of those texts here? Uh, there is this uh, little saying here, as you can see here in red characters, in the first line of Chinese text, La Zhang. Uh, my teacher, as you can see, Wu Si La Zhang, Zuo Ru Shi Shuo. So my master, La Jiang, said this and this and this. Now, the problem is that there was also a discussion on who that La Zhang is. Uh, quite early, uh, Shen Wenrong has suggested that that La Zhang is actually representing Gampopa, Sonam Lintian. Gampopa is a very famous Tibetan Buddhist master, founder of the so-called Kagyu school. His identity as a Kagyu master has is recently been discussed because 
uh, there are scholars such as Marta, for example, who believe that, uh, and I think she has probably a very good reason for that, uh, that not probably, definitely, uh, that Gampopa, in fact, uh, was a Kadampa master rather than a Kagyu, but uh, that's not relevant for the moment. We can actually see. Uh, and that Dakpo, uh, sorry, and that this Lajie is a uh, Chinese translation of uh, Lajie, yeah, doctor, yeah. As we know, Gampopa's, one of Gampopa's name was Dakpo Lajie, the doctor or from uh, Dakpo, Dvakpo. Now, but this has all remained uh, uh, quite, I would say, on the hearsay basis uh, before my younger colleague Yandia here actually identified this Chinese in this Tibet. And from that we know, yeah, that at least some, but probably all uh, of the Tangu texts on Mahamudra, in fact, well, no, so they originate from this Gampopa, from Gampopa Sonam Linchen. So again, who worked also in the 11th century, so we can actually see, yeah, that again, just as in the case with uh, Gansai, as in the case which we have seen with Ram Lugum, yeah, it is again Buddhism of 11th, 12th century, yeah, very modern, so to speak, uh, is found in the Tangut collection. It's found in Tangut collections. Uh, one of the very important uh, textual groups or textual collections here for the Tibetan Buddhism will be, of course, uh, the Dayu Emma, the Dzogchen. Dzogchen. Uh, as we, of course, know that Dzogchen is the one of the main teachings or doctrines of Nimapa, uh, of the old school of Tibetan Buddhism, Nimapa. Uh, there is also a variety of various, well, a variety of texts. Uh, one of the important categories of Dzogchen texts would be the so-called Samchogluga, the five texts of the mind class, Shinbu, yeah? The texts of the mind class. Uh, the group of, the, of those texts is not very stable or is not extremely stable, but nonetheless, yeah? Uh, we have a full collection of these uh, texts in Tangut. Uh, in Tangut. Uh, but what I think is important for us to mention is that, again, we can probably spend some time and try to identify or find out uh, some uh, textual connections. Uh, there is this uh, text. Uh, which is collected in this composition here in Dutch and Yadao Miti. Uh, this text is, is called Dash uh, Uyin Yin Ding. So in the Syria, Yin Ding is this one. Dash Uyin Yin Ding. And there is this uh, uh, little composition there. Uh, known as what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lui in Chinese. Uh, that's uh, the Chinese title, yeah? That's the uh, Chinese title. The uh, Tibetan title is Jianchu Gisem Gompa Donjupa, which is also, again, Chanjing Lui. All right, so what we do have here. So I would like to like draw your attention a little bit. So we have that translation of that Chanding Lui, six meanings of concentration here in a composition known as five parts of the Dharma Ria. So here it is in the extreme left. The, chain, the text, Da Shu Yin Yin Ding, that one I have written there, it also exists in two versions. Uh, sorry, there is Chinese from Dutch and Yao Miti and Tangut, Tangut from the Chinese version, uh, so and Tangut from the Tangut version of Dashu Yin Ding. 
and there is a uh, Tibetan text here uh, to the to the right. Now, what can we say here? These two texts in Dash or Yin Yin Yin, they are they translate each other, and both of these texts they deviate sometimes, not very importantly, and not in terms of subject matter, uh, uh, but also from the Tibetan. Now, the extreme left five parts of the Dharma realm, which is that that Dasho Yinini, is basically the same as the extreme right, the Tibetan. So the Tibet, the Tangut in the extreme left uh, originates from the Tibetan in the extreme right. Now, these two in the middle, uh, they also are based on the Tibetan text. But here we can actually observe, yeah, that in fact, Tangut is closer to Tibetan than the Chinese. The Tangut is closer to Tibetan than Chinese. I'm not going to discuss this in a very minute details, but what we can actually see is that in Chinese Dasho Yin Yin Ding, this Chinese version is also not translation of this Tibetan here, but rather a translation of the Tangut, which is in the middle left. So that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, another understanding here would be uh, also like this. Uh, that was by one of my uh, students, Yu Xiaogang, who had uh, discovered uh, something like that. Uh, there is this, uh, he was studying a group of texts uh, based, uh, I mean, gravitating around the so-called six yogas of Naropa, which is also one of the important Tibetan esoteric lineages. So what he had found here, you see there are two Tangut characters, right? One is B and the other is me, yeah? Uh, for those well-versed in the uh, phonology, uh, B and me are basically the same thing. Now, uh, the B and me are uh, only different with one dot on top. So the, among those, me rip is, tan is Chinese, tha, just different, yeah, zhen. Whereas B is quite different, is guang, yeah, and it's oza, oza. Now, what we really say here, yeah, is that in, in the Chinese version of the text, in the Chinese version of the text, which is found in Dachan Yadao Midi, the translator was using this Guang. Uh, sorry, was the, the Chinese translator used the word Guang. Whereas in Tangut, it is ha, Zhang. Now the problem is the problem is that the original Tibetan, as we have found, is actually Zhang and not Oza. So what can we say is that the Chinese translator he was not really looking into Tibetan. He was looking into Tangut, and he just mistook, misunderstood these things. Yeah. And instead of Xian, which is correct, he used Guang, which is wrong. He used, instead of me, which would be correct, he used B, which is wrong, yeah? So that generally indicates, yeah, uh, that uh, he was not looking on uh, Tibetan text, but on the Tango text, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's more or less, yeah. So if we look a little bit uh, further, then we will, in fact, see, yeah, that uh, that is how this works. Uh, just as we consider a very substantial presence of, uh, let us say, uh, Gampopa's teachings in the Tango Triel, then we should probably take a better look, yeah, into what Gampopa was actually doing. Uh, and a more or less commonplace understanding is that Gampopa, as we can see, he did two things. He had the so-called doctrinal Buddhism of Kadampa and combined it 
uh, with the teachings or practices of Mahamudra. So this was his main achievement. That's how he, uh, that's how he did it. And the, generally, this is exactly the situation, yeah, which we observe in uh, Tangut Buddhism. So we have a variety of texts which belong to the category of the middle way of Jundao, Tibetan one. And this middle way, Kadampa, is generally gravitating around the text known as Satyadvaya Vatara. We have mentioned this shortly before by Nega Atisha. Yeah. And then we have a variety of texts of Gampopa's Mahamudra lineage. Yeah? So then again, uh, this is very correct representation of the 12th century Tibetan Buddhism and specifically of what later became Kagyu. Kagyupa, Gaji, uh, of what later became Kagyu. So uh, this is also something which is very up to date, mm, very modern at that particular moment. The same goes for the Dayuama, for the Dzogchen, yeah? uh, because again, we know uh, that in the uh, 12th century, uh, generally uh, in the Tangut period, uh, there was quite a revival or a white uh, or a period of uh, wide dissemination of Dzogchen teachings in the areas of what is modern uh, Qinghai. And again, there are uh, all kinds of uh, textual uh, uh, confirmations for that. So again, we can see uh, that uh, Tangut Buddhist texts, they still represent, yeah, uh, the modern situation, the modern situation, yeah, the situation which was on the ground in the 12th and 13th century. And the same is true as uh, we have tried to show uh, for the uh, uh, Sinitic Buddhism in uh, Shisha as well. Uh, so, uh, more or less, uh, these are the things in a very, very brief way, yeah, in a very, very, mm, I would say, general uh, mm, thing, uh, what we need to know, yeah, about the Tangut Buddhism, uh, it's basically that it was not uh, something which developed randomly. It's really a product of its time, yeah. It is a very truthful uh, representation uh, of the lineages of both Sinitic and Tibetan, how they existed and how they developed in the late 11th and then until the 13th century. So the value of the Tangut texts is not just per se, but as we have mentioned before, when they are correctly located within their historic environment, and only then they can reveal yeah, uh, their uh, true value and importance. The meaning of the Tangut texts is not so much is that they tell us something which we don't know. Uh, this happens rarely. But on the other hand, uh, they could actually yeah, uh, improve our knowledge of the development of the major traditions, let's say of Sinitic and Tibetan, during those formative years. Because in many cases, the bigger, the greater traditions, they do not really have yeah, a lot of indigenous or actual materials for their own history. And the Tengu texts, yeah, they basically uh, fill up uh, those gaps. And of course, what is uniquely Tangut as other things which we have mentioned in the middle of our talk, yeah? Uh, these are the called uh, the conflation, yeah? Uh, between the Sinitic and Tibetan, yeah? So this is something which is uh, uniquely Tangut. But then again, uh, it should be located, yeah? This uniqueness, so to speak, it also originates uh, from a combination or interaction between uh, the 
Tibetan and uh, or Sinitic and uh, what it is, uh, Tibetan elements. So, well, I guess that might be the size of it for today. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much.